What's up, fellow podcaster? Welcome back. In today's podcast interview breakdown, I'll be reacting to a TED Talks interview with Elon Musk. Here we go. So, Elon, um, a few hours ago, you made an offer to buy Twitter. <laughs> Why? So I'm going to just stop right there. This is a great first question. I talk about this in the program I have created. What's up, my beta testers? Um, and I talk about the power of why. It's such a simple question that even if you were to talk to a small child and they give you kind of like a one word answer, you can always ask why and you can see the gears start turning in their heads. So great, great question right off the rip. <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> Little bird tweeted in my ear or something. I don't know. By the way, have you seen the movie Ted about the bear? I, I, I have. <laughs> I have. It's a good movie. <laughs> don't mention that here. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, was there a question? <laughs> why, why, why make that? All so, that's the thing. If you've watched any interview with Elon Musk. If you haven't watched Joe Rogan and Elon Musk, Elon's like, you, he's an innovator and a visionary entrepreneur, but he's kind of, I don't want to say odd, just different. Like he's a creative. So I, you got to be careful how you handle these situations. I don't know why he brought up Ted, the movie. Maybe I missed it. Comment below. I, I don't know what just happened. Alpha. Oh, so, um, well, I think it's very important for, uh, there to be an inclusive arena for free speech, uh, where all, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Um, the, the Twitter has become kind of the de facto town square, um, so uh, it, it's just really important that people have the, both the, uh, the reality and the perception uh, that they are able to speak freely within the bounds of the law. Um, and, you know, so one of the things that I believe Twitter should do is open source the algorithm. Um, and make any changes uh, to people's tweets, you know, if they're emphasized or de-emphasized, uh, that action should be should made apparent so you can, anyone can see that that action has been taken. So there's, there's no sort of behind the scenes uh, manipulation, either algorithmically or manually. Um, my question right there would be, how exactly do you do that? Because every other platform, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, whatever's coming out in the future, all run by algorithms. So how do you get in front of that? How is it uh, public knowledge about what everything, how everything works and what's going on? But, <clears throat> last week when we spoke, Elon, um, I asked you whether you were thinking of taking over. You said, no way. You said, I, I do not want to own Twitter. It is a recipe for misery. <laughs> everyone will blame me for everything. What on earth changed? No, I think, I think everyone will still blame me for everything. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. If, it, something, if, if I acquire Twitter and something goes wrong, it's my fault, 100%. <laughs> I, I think there will be quite a few hours, uh, yes. Um, and also, how does it feel to be blamed for everything? Like, literally, almost everything he does, he gets blamed for something, and at such a high level. Like, I, I what, what's that like as well? It, will, it but, will be miserable, but you still want to do it. Why? I mean, I hope it's not too miserable, uh, but um, I, I, I just think it's important to the fun. Like, uh, it's important to the fun function of democracy. Um, it's important to the function of uh, the United States uh, as, as a free country and many other countries and to help, actually to help freedom in the world uh, so, more broadly than the US. Um, so, and so I, I think it's, uh, it, it's a, you know, I think there's, there's the, the risk, civilizational risk uh, is decreased if Twitter, the, the more we can increase the trust of Twitter as a public platform and so I, I do think this will be somewhat painful, and I'm not sure that I will actually be able to to acquire it. Um, and I should also say the, the intent is is to uh, retain as many shareholders as is allowed by the law in a private company, which I think is around 2,000 or so. So we'll, it's, it's not like a, a, it's definitely not, not from the standpoint of let me figure out how to monopolize or maximize my ownership of Twitter, uh, but we'll try to bring along as many shareholders as we right. as we're allowed. And it's so easy for me to pause this because I can tell the interview guy, like, this is also a skill in itself because the interview is never about you as the interviewer, as me, the host, or as you, the host, or the podcast, or whatever you want to call yourself. So he did a great job catching himself there and not talking over him and letting him talk. I'd be curious to ask 
if and when he did take over, what that would feel like as far as uh, <laughs> do you get a hit in the gut as far as how much money you're going to be spending. And if you did acquire or you did a massive takeover, whatever you're whatever you're doing or whatever you're planning to do, are you prepared for the blowback for the employees? Because we saw what happened with Joe Rogan when he, with Spotify, all these artists started coming out. You got people protesting and things like that. Are you prepared for that? And how are you, how are you going to deal with that backlash? Because it's going to be everywhere inside the company and it's going to be all over the news. Not to. You don't um, necessarily want to pay out 40 or whatever it is, billion dollars in cash. You'd, you'd like them to come, come with you in, in, in the Yeah, but it's, it's, I mean, I mean, I could technically afford it. Um, I, I heard that. I heard that. Um, but, 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 it's, but what I'm saying is this is, this is, this is, a, this is not a, a, a way to sort of make money. You know, I think this is, it's just that I think this is, um, this could, my, my strong intuitive sense is that uh, having a public platform that is maximally trusted um, and, 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 and broadly inclusive um, is extremely important to the future of civilization. But you've, um, you've described I, yourself. I'd be like, what, what does that mean? What is the fu- What do you see the future of civilization being? And what, to go back to what he was saying about how his intuitive mind works a little bit, I would have gone back a little bit and just been like, well, like, how does that work? What do you see? What is your process? When does it come to you like this? Just to see what he says, just to kind of get inside his head a little bit. So, I don't care about the economics at all. You, okay, that's that's cool to hear. You, this is not about the economics. It, it's for the, the, the moral good that you think it will achieve. You're, you've described yourself, Elon, as a free speech absolutist. But does that mean that there's literally nothing that people can't say and it's okay? This is a good question. I would have just asked, what is your definition of what is your definition of free speech? Well, I, I think uh, obviously uh, Twitter or any forum is bound by the laws of the country that it operates in. Um, so to, obviously there, there are some limitations on free speech uh, in, in the U.S. And, and of course, uh, Twitter would have to abide by those uh, right. rules. So, so, so you can't incite people to violence, like, the, yeah. the, 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 like a, di- a direct incitement to violence. You, know, you can't do the equivalent of crying fire in a, in a movie theater, for example. No, that would be a crime. Yeah, right. I pretty, it should be a crime. But, but here's, here's the challenge, is, is that it's, it's such a nuanced difference between different things. So there's, <clears throat> there's incitement to violence. Yeah. That's a no if it's illegal. Um, there's hate speech, which some forms of hate speech are fine. You know, I hate spinach. Um, I mean, if it's uh, sautéed in a, you know, cream sauce, it can be quite nice. <laughs> For an interview that's supposed to be kind of serious in a way, unless that's like their angle with Ted, I don't know. But that is the third time that he has made kind of like light of the situation and trying to like break the ice a little bit uh, or to break the tension. I love it. Uh, I'm just wondering... I, I, I'll be honest, I don't know who this guy is interviewing him. Uh, he's doing great so far. Uh, but just like the vibes, it's kind of serious and stuffy, which talking about this can be because I already know where he's kind of going with this. But it's just interesting to see like how he's kind of like joking about it. I don't know how you would incorporate asking him about it. Or it's like, why are you in such a good mood? Like you just... Spend God knows forty billion dollars, and you don't even own the thing. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'd want to ask him like, what? Why is he in a good mood? Or like, you know, you seem like you're in a great mood about it. Like, what do you? I think you know something. I think he knows something. But so, so <laughs> but, the, but the problem is, so, 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 let's say someone says, okay, here's one tweet. I hate politician X. Yeah. Next tweet is, I wish politi- politician X wasn't alive, as we some of us have said about Putin right now, for example. So that. So this is tough, too, because regardless of where you stand politically, um, he is treading the line very carefully. So we're not offending right or left, which is whatever. And that's actually part of my deeper purpose in my program is to kind of get people on the right and the left to kind of like go back to normal of how it was and just like, okay, you can have different opinions and views than me. And it's okay. <laughs> like, so, but he's treading the line a little bit because I'm sure he got the talk before this whole thing happened. So, uh, yeah, he's doing good. That's a legitimate speech. Another tweet is I wish politician X wasn't alive with a picture of their head with a gun sight o- over it, or that plus their address. I mean, at some point, 
someone has to make a decision as to which of those is not okay. Can an algorithm do that? Or surely you need human judgment at some point? No, I think, the, like I said, we're, we're, in, in my view, uh, Twitter should um, match the laws of the, of the country of, and, and, and really, you know, that, that, there's an obligation to, to do that. Um, uh, but going beyond, going beyond that um, and having it be unclear who's making what changes to, who, to, to where, uh, having tweets sort of mysteriously be promoted and demoted with no insight into what's going on, uh, having a black box algorithm uh, promote some things and other, not, not other things, I think this can be quite dangerous. For those, I would have asked for those people who don't know what is a black box algorithm and what does that mean? And then he would have gone on to explain it. And it's like, well, how would you, how would you change it to be not a black box algorithm or what, however he explained it? So, so, so the idea of opening the algorithm is, is a huge deal. And I think many yeah. people would, would welcome that of, of understanding exactly how it's making the decision. And, and crit critique it. And critique like, it. Like, like, I mean, what, what I mean is like, like I think like the, the code should be on GitHub, you know? So then, uh, and, and so people can look through it and say like, uh, I see a problem here. I don't, I don't agree with this. Um, they can highlight issues, right. um, suggest changes in, in the same way that you sort of update Linux or, or Signal or something like that, you know? But as, as um, I understand it, at, yeah. like at, at some point right now, the, what the algorithm would do is it would look at, for example, how many people have flagged a tweet as obnoxious. Um, and then, at some point, a human has to look at it and make, make a decision as to does this cross the line or not. That, that the algorithm itself can't, I don't think yet, um, tell the difference between legal and okay and, and, and definitely obnoxious. And so the, the question is, which humans you know, make, make that call? I mean, do you have, do you have a picture of, of that? Right now, Twitter and Facebook and others, you know, they've hired thousands of people to try to help make wise decisions. And the trouble is that no one can agree on, on what is wise. How do you solve that? And to if thousands of people are being hired to do that what's the vetting process for that uh, how many ethics things do you have to go through i can only imagine what type of people are being hired for that sort of thing and i i, I would i would dig a little deeper into that as well for the humans making the calls whether what is considered hate speech or what is considered excuse me what is considered free speech and what isn't well i i, I think we, we would want to err on this if if in doubt uh, let 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 the speech let let it exist. Uh, it would have you know if, if it's a you know a, a gray area. I would say let let the, let the tweet exist. Um, but obviously you, you know in, in a case where there's perhaps uh, a lot of controversy uh, that you would not want to necessarily promote that tweet. If uh, you know so the I'm not I'm not saying this is that I have all the answers here. Um, but. I, I do think that we want to be just very reluctant to delete things and, and have um, just, just be very cautious with, with, with per permanent bans. Uh, you know, t timeouts I think are better or, uh, than, than, than sort of permanent bans. And um, uh, but just just in general, like I said, uh, how, how it won't be perfect, but I think we want it to really uh, have, like I said, the perception and reality that speech is as free as reasonably possible. And a good sign as to whether there is free speech is, uh, is, is someone you don't like allowed to say something you don't like? And if that is the case, then we have free speech. And it's, it's damn annoying when someone you don't like says something you don't like. That is a sign of a healthy, functioning, uh, free speech situation. And that is a $40 billion price tag. Our free speech is, according, if you had to put a price tag on it, would be $40 billion. Uh, and he doesn't even own all of Twitter. But I would almost ask him, like, you've got unlimited capital to do anything you want. Why are, are you buying it to kind of just stick it to Twitter or something? Or is it like, why don't you just create your own app? Why don't you create your own social network and just why go after Twitter? I don't know. I don't know. So I think many people would agree with that. And look at the reaction online. Many people are excited by you coming in and the changes you're proposing. Some others are, are absolutely horrified. Here's how they would see it. They would say, wait a sec, we agree that, that Twitter is an incredibly important town square. It is, a, it is you know, where the world exchanges opinion about life and death matters. How on earth could it be owned by the world's richest person? That can't be right. So how, how do you, I mean, what's the response there? Is there any way that you can distance yourself from the actual decision-making that matters on content at, 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 in some very clear way that is convincing to people? Um, whoever owns Twitter, I, the name's escaping me right now and I should know his name, my bad. 
let's see what his net worth is. Just because he's got, if he does have more than Elon or Elon has more, what does that have anything to do with what's going on? Oh, it's owned by the richest per- Okay. Like, it's not just social media apps that are, uh, look at everything else in the world that's owned by the richest people. I don't know. I, don't, I didn't like that question. Well, like I said, I think the, it's, it's very important that, that like the, the, the algorithm be open sourced and that any manual uh, adjustments be uh, identified. Like, so if this tweet, if somebody did something to a tweet, it's, there's information attached to it that this, that action was taken. And I, 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 I won't personally be, uh, you know, in there editing tweets, um, so, but, but you'll know if, if something was done to, to promote, demote, or otherwise affect a, a tweet. Um, you know, as for media sort of ownership, I mean, you've got, you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg owning Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, um, and with a share ownership structure that will uh, have Mark Zuckerberg the 14th still uh, controlling those uh, entities. Mm. Um, so, um, like, I think that's what I just said, or I think that's what he's point he's trying to make. Correct me if I'm wrong. But there he goes again. He's joking around this whole time. Like he's he's having the time of his life. I really wish I could do these type of interviews. And by the way, if this is your first time here, I have 10 years of media experience. I did five years as a weather. I was a weatherman uh, and a general assignment reporter covering actual news. Uh, but then my last five was spent in entertainment news and uh, interviewing celebrities, influencers and high profile people. So and also the reason why I do these is because I don't get hired to do this stuff. So it's like, do I cry about it or just react to it? But if I were there, I would do my best to, I would do my job, but he is like showing signs of like just being chummy and joking around. You could do this too. This guy's a little stuffy. Like you think he's just like, he wants his serious answers. Like it's a, I know it's Ted talks, but he's acting like it's kind of like CNN or hard news. It's like, dude, just, Slighten up a little bit. Actually, um, <laughs> well, certainly the, we the, won't have that at Twitter. The, the, if, if you commit to opening up the algorithm, that, that definitely gives some level of confidence. Um, yes. Talk about talk about some of the other changes that you proposed. So you, you, the edit button, that's that's definitely coming. If you if yes. you have your way, yes. yeah. And um, how do you? How I do mean, you... I, I think I mean one. Frankly, um, the. Well, a top priority I have, I would have, is is eliminating the the spam and, and scam bots, um, and the bot armies that are on Twitter. Um, you know, I think I think these these fun influence the. They're not, they're, they're, they, they make the product much worse. <laughs> um, if I, if, you know, if I had a Dogecoin for every crypto scam I saw, <laughs> we'd have more, you know, hundred. I, <laughs> he's still joking around. Um, how do you do that? I heard the edit button. I actually deleted Twitter a long time ago, but an edit button would have been nice. I think all platforms need that. Uh, so that would be nice for it to, now that I think about it, that would be the only platform that has an edit button besides YouTube. <laughs> um, that would be nice. And how do you stop all the bots? How do you do that? What's I, is that a software? Like, do you know the process already? I mean, I know you can launch rockets that launch into space and then come back. Surely that wouldn't be an issue, but it's like, how do you do that? How do you create that? God, it's like start a YouTube channel so you could document the process on everything that's coming out of there. A billion Doge going. So. <laughs> do, do you regret sparking a sort of storm of excitement over Doge and, you know, where, where it's gone or... I mean, I think Doge is fun, and you know, I've always said, don't bet the farm on Dogecoin. Uh, FYI, right. you know, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I think I think it's it's I like dogs and I like memes, and uh, it's got both of those. And, <laughs> but just uh, on the on the edit button, how how do you get around the problem of so someone tweets Elon rocks and it's tweeted by two million people, um, and um, and then then after that they edit it. So I'm, Elon sucks, and um, and then all those retweets, they're all embarrassed. And how, how do you, how do you avoid that type of changing of meaning? So that mm. retweeters are exploited. That was a good question. I like it. Well, I think uh, you know you, you don't only have the edit capability for a short period of time, and probably the thing mm. to do at, upon the edit would be to zero out uh, all retweets and favorites. Okay. Um, I'm open to ideas, though. You know. So, in one way, the um, algorithm works kind of well for you right now. I just I wanted to show you this. This is. 
he keeps it. He's mentioned it a couple of times that he's open to constructive criticism. It's like, how do you know what is constructive and just somebody kind of chirping online? Like, Oh, we don't have the edit button. You suck, man. Like, how do you differentiate like a good idea from a bad idea? I've always wondered that with like big tech companies. Cause, uh, I did a, um, podcast interview breakdown with Gary V and Mark Zuckerberg. And they talked about that the same thing. Like when they brought out the wall for the first time, everyone, when they changed the whole format, everyone was pissed and whatever, but it's like, how do you, if everybody's mad, how do you not go all the way back? Or it's just like, ah, what are these people now? Like, I don't know. I've just been curious to differentiate the two. Works kind of well for you right now. I just, I wanted to show you this. This is so this is a typical tweet of, of, of mine, kind of lame and wordy and whatever. And look at and the amazing response it gets is this. Oh my God, 97 <laughs> likes. Um, and then I tried another one. Um, and uh, <laughs> 29,000 likes. So the algorithm at, at least seems to be at the moment, you know, if Elon Musk expand to the world immediately. Um, I, I, not bad, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I guess so. I mean, this if you own Twitter, would you, if anybody talked about you at all, whether they put at Elon Musk or hashtag Elon Musk, would you build the algorithm in such a way specifically for your name to see what would happen or to see what people are saying? This is good. Cool. I mean, you, but, but you, so, so help, help us understand how, how it is you've built this incredible um, following on Twitter yourself when. I mean, some of the people who, who love you the most look at some of what you tweet and they, they, they think it's somewhere between um, embarrassing and crazy. Some of it's amazing. I mean, it's a little. But is that actually why it's worked? Or what, why, why has it worked? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm you know, tweeting more or less stream of consciousness. You know, it's not like, let me think about some grand plan about my Twitter or whatever. You know, I'm like literally you know, on the toilet or something. I'm like, oh, this is funny. And then tweet that out, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that, that's like most of them. <laughs> You know, oversharing. Over uh, <laughs> but um, but you are obsessed with getting the most out of every minute of your day, and so why yeah, not? You know. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I just, I just like try to tweet out like things that are interesting or funny, or you know, and then people seem to like it. So if if you are unsuccessful, actually, let me, before I ask that, let me ask this. In fact, I don't. Yeah. So how can I say? Is uh, funding secured? <laughs> I, I have sufficient uh, assets to complete the, uh, <laughs> it's not a forward looking statement, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that is a great question. Cause we, it's like, okay, it's not $40 billion in like a sack, you know, it's like not a sack of cash. So as he was saying, he's got assets and stuff, but it would be interesting to see how it was paid for, like how he is going to pay for it. I mean, cause I'm sure it's going to be more. I mean, by the time of this recording, I'm sure it's going to be more. <laughs> uh, I have to. I mean, I can do it if possible. Right. Um, so, um, and um, I mean, I should say actually, even in the in, in, originally uh, the uh, with, with Tesla back in the day, funding was actually secured. I want to be clear about that. Um, in fact, this may be a good opportunity to to, to clarify that. Um, if funding was indeed secured, um, and uh, I should say, like, why, why do I do not have respect for the SEC in that situation? And I don't mean to um, blame everyone at the SEC, but certainly the San Francisco office. Um, it's because the SEC uh, knew that the funding was secured, um, but they pursued the, uh, an active public investigation nonetheless. At the time, Tesla was in a precarious financial situation, and I was told by the banks that if I did not agree to, to settle with the SEC, that they would, the banks would cease providing working capital and Tesla would go bankrupt immediately. So that's like having a gun to your child's head. Uh, so I was forced to concede to the SEC unlawfully, those bastards. Um, <laughs> and, and, and now they, 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 uh, it, it makes it look like I lied when I did not in fact lie. I was, I was forced to admit that I lied for, to save Tesla's life, and that's the only reason. Huh? Like, this is the type of stuff. It's like, how, like, what did he ask earlier about? Oh, everybody's worrying about all of, the richest man in the world owning Twitter. The SEC just strong armed him and basically threatened him to back off. So it's like, 
he said, do you, do you back down? Do you stick it to him and figure out a way to get even more funding to just totally bulldoze them to prove a point? Uh, that's insane. Um, can you sue for that? Is that legal? Uh, oh boy. <laughs> Even what's actually happened. Given what's actually happened to Tesla since then though, aren't you glad that you didn't take it private? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to put yourself in the position at the time. Tesla was under the most relentless short seller attack in the history of the stock market. Uh, there's something called short and distort, um, where the barrage of, of negativity that Tesla was experiencing from short sellers in Wall Street was beyond all belief. Tesla was the most shorted stock in the history of stock markets. Yeah. This is saying something. So, you know, this was affecting our ability to hire people. It was affecting our ability to sell cars. Um, it was, uh, they were, yeah, it was terrible. Um, th th yeah, th they wanted Tesla to die so bad they could taste it. Well, most of them have paid the price. Yes. How they, where are they now? <laughs> um, so that was a very strong statement. I mean, obviously, a lot of people um, who, who support you, I would have thought, would say, you have so much to offer the world on the upside, on the vision side. Don't, don't waste your time getting, getting distracted by these, these battles that bring out negativity and, and, and make people feel that you're being defensive. Like, people don't like fights, especially with, with powerful government authorities. They'd rather, they'd rather buy into your, to your dream. Do you, do you, like, aren't you encouraged by people just, just to edit that? In that, you know, temptation out and uh, go with the, the bigger story? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I would say, like, you know, I'm somewhat of a mixed bag, you know, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're a fighter and you, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't like to lose and, and you, you, you are determined that you don't, basically. I, I mean, you are... Sure, I don't like to lose. I'm not sure many people do. Um, the, but the, the truth matters to me a, a lot. Like, really, like, sort of pathologically, it matters to me. Okay, so the power of why. Why does the truth matter to you so much? So you don't like to lose. If in this case you are not successful in, you know, the board does not accept your offer, you've said you won't go higher, is there a plan B? There is. <laughs> I, I, think we, I think we would like to hear a little bit about plan B. For, for another time, I think. Another time? Yeah. All right. I, that, that's a nice tease. All right. So um, <laughs> I, I would love to try to understand this brain of yours more, Ilan. I, 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 if, with your permission, I'd like to just play this. This is the... Oh, actually, before we do that, um, here was one of the, of the thousands of questions that people asked. I thought this was actually quite a good one. Um, if you could go back in time and change one decision you made along the way, do your own edit button. <laughs> Which one would it be and why? Do you mean like a career decision or something? Just any, any decision over the last few years, like your decision to invest in Twitter in the first place or your uh, anything. Um, I mean, the, the worst business decision I ever made was um, not starting Tesla with just JB's travel. By mm -hmm. far the worst decision I've ever made is, is not just starting Tesla with JB. That, 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 that's the number one by far. All right, so J JB's travel. And when you found that out, how did it make you feel like as a business person who is so successful, like, how does that make you feel or how did that make you feel? Also to, uh, on top of that Twitter question, I would have asked him, is time travel possible? And are you going to explore that at any time? By the way, uh, if whoever sees this has a connection to Elon Musk, I want to put my uh, information right here on the screen for you if you would like to set up an interview. All right. Robert was, was the visionary co-founder who, who, who was obsessed with and knew so much about batteries. And your, your decision to go with Tesla, the company as it was, meant that you got locked into what you concluded. No, was a weird architecture now. This, 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 of, there's, uh, there's a lot of confusion. Tesla... Um, Tesla did not exist in any, Tesla was a shell company with no employees, uh, no intellectual property when I invested, but the, a, a false narrative has been created by um, one of the other co-founders, uh, Martin Everhard, and I don't want to get into, right. the, into yeah, the nastiness here, but uh, the, I didn't invest in an existing company, we created a company, yeah. uh, and ultimately the creation of that company uh, was, was done by uh, JB and me, um, and 
Unfortunately, there's a, someone else, an, another co-founder who has made it his life's mission uh, to make it sound like he, he created the company, which is false. Wasn't there another issue right at the heart of the development of the Tesla Model 3, where Tesla almost went bankrupt? And I, I think you have said that part of the reason for that was that you overestimated the extent to which it was possible at that time to automate a, a, a factory. A huge amount was spent kind of over-automating, and, and it didn't work. Mm. And it nearly took the company down. Is, Good is that question. Fair? Uh, I mean, first of all, it's important to understand, like, what, what has Tesla actually accomplished that is, that is most noteworthy? Um, it is not the creation of an electric vehicle or, or creating an electric vehicle, vehicle prototype or low volume production of a, of a car. There have been uh, hundreds of car startups over the years, hundreds. And uh, in fact, at one point, um, Bloomberg counted up the number of electric vehicle startups, and they, I think they got to almost 500. Yeah. So the hard part is not creating a prototype or going into limited production. The, 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 the absolutely difficult thing, which has not been accomplished by an American car company in 100 years, is reaching volume production without going bankrupt. Well, that is the actual hard thing. Um, the last company, American company to reach volume production without going bankrupt was Chrysler in the 20s. Right. And, and, and it nearly happened to Tesla. Yes, it, but it's not like, oh, geez, I guess if we'd just done more manual stuff, things would have been fine. Of right. course not. Uh, that is definitely not the case. Uh, would he have let it go bankrupt? Like, the company, like, how much, like, does that mean if Tesla went bankrupt, you would go bankrupt? Because if you had the money, I feel like, and that's your baby, you would have saved it, right? Am I missing something, or I just want to make sure? Uh, so, the, we basically messed up almost every aspect of the Model 3 production line, uh, from from cells to, to packs to drive, drive inverters, motors, uh, body line, the paint shop, uh, final assembly, um, everything. Everything was messed up. Um, and I, I, lived in that fa I, I lived in the Fremont and, and Nevada factories uh, for, for three years, fixing the, the, that production line, running around like a maniac through every part of that factory, living with the team. Would you start a YouTube channel so we can see this whole entire process? I would have loved to see all that. Yeah. I slept on the floor so that, the, so that the, the team who was going through a hard time could see me on the floor. Uh, that, that they knew that I was not in some ivory tower. And Whatever pain they experienced, I, was, I had it more. And some people who knew you well actually thought you were making a terrible mistake, that you were driving us, you were... You were driving yourself to the edge of sanity almost, and, yes, and, not, and, sure. and, that, and that you were in danger of making bad choices. And in fact, I heard you say last week, Elon, that, that you, because of Tesla's huge value now, and, and you know, the, the, the significance of every minute that you spend, that you are in danger of sort of obsessing over it, spending all this time to the point of, to the edge of sanity. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't sound super wise, isn't there? Like, your... your your time, your, your completely sane, centered, rested time and decision making is more powerful and compelling than, than that sort of, I, I can barely hold my eyes open. So, so surely it should be an absolute strategic priority to look after yourself. I mean, there wasn't any other way to make it work. There were three years of hell. Um, 17, eight, 2017, 18 and 19 were three years, the longest period of excruciating pain in my life. Uh, there wasn't any other way, and we barely made it, and we were on the ragged edge of bankruptcy the entire time. So, so when you felt like around, I want sorry. pain, I don't like it. Um, those were three, three, so, so, so much pain, uh, what, but it had to be done, or Tesla would be dead. When you looked around the Gigafactory that we saw images of earlier um, last week, and just see where the company has come, I mean, do you feel that that this this challenge of figuring out the the new way of manufacturing um, that you that you, you actually have an edge now that it's different, that you've figured out how to do this, and, and um, from th th those three years w won't be repeated. You've actually figured out a new way of manufacturing. At this point, I think I know more about manufacturing than anyone currently alive on Earth. Tweet <laughs> up. <laughs> what would have happened had you gone bankrupt? How would you handle going from being the one of the richest people in the world back down to zero? 
How would that make you feel? And how long would it take you to bounce back? Because I guarantee you, I could see the headlines now. Elon Musk goes broke, blah, blah, blah. And then like three months later, rising like a phoenix, he's like, oh, he's worth two billion now. Like, what would you have done? Do you have any like old notebooks stored away with like million dollar ideas or do, do they just stay up in your head or would you invest in something or get a group of people to invest in something? What would you would have done? What, what would you would have done? Yeah. yeah. I, can tell you, I can tell you how every damn part, part in that car is made. It's basically, if you just live on the factory, you live in the factory for three years and, and just... That was nice. So just, <laughs> that was... Poignant note or something. <laughs> Someone um, wants to compose a symphony to that uh, expression of confidence. Uh, something like that. I have no idea what that is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. We, we, I, I, every aspect of a car, six ways to Sunday, I know. I mean, you, you, you talk about scale right now. You're, you're, you're in the middle of writing your new master plan. And you've said that scale is at the heart of it. Why does scale matter? Why are you obsessed with it? What are you thinking? Yeah, I, well, good see, question. In order, in order to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy, uh, there must be scale, um, because we've got to transition um, a, a vast economy that is currently uh, overly dependent on fossil fuels to a, a sustainable energy economy, one where the energy is, uh, yeah, I mean, we've got to do it. And, uh, so, so the energy's got to be sustainably generated with wind, solar, uh, hydro, geothermal. I, I, I'm a believer in nuclear, as, uh, as well, I think, gave a talk about. And, uh, and then, you, 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 since solar and wind is intermittent, you have to have stationary storage batteries, and, and then uh, we're going to transition uh, all transport um, to, to electric. Uh, if, if we do those things, we have a sustainable energy future. The faster we do those things, the less risk we, 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 the, the less risk we, we uh, put to the environment. Uh, so sooner is better, uh, and, and so scale is very important. Um, you know, it's not about it's not about fresh releases; it's about tonnage. What was the tonnage of uh, of batteries produced um, and obviously done in a sustainable way. And, and uh, our estimate is that approximately 300 terawatt hours of battery storage is needed to transition uh, transport, uh, electricity, and, and heating and cooling uh, to a fully electric situation. A terawatt? <laughs> Tell me about the terawatt. Um, back to the future reference. I'm sorry. I get, what is it? <laughs> what the hell is a terawatt? <laughs> uh if you're saying that i uh, just uh, oh he's talking about sustainable energy in all these different ways surely he's here heard about the guy who invented a car who where it was purely ran on water do you think you could recreate that and if you could uh there is a theory of what happened to said guy who had such an invention would you be worried about that do you worry about that now with all these breakthroughs you're having in technology i feel like if you take away this fossil fuel thing i, I mean a lot of people i don't know maybe it's just a theory a lot of companies are going to lose money and when these people lose have these hundred million dollar companies they will do whatever it takes to protect their baby. And if that means trying to take you down, they're going to do it. Has that happened? Are you scared of that at all? Others may, there may be some different estimates out, out there, but uh, our, our estimate is 300 terawatt hours. Yeah. So we dug into this a lot in the interview that we yeah. reported last week, and so people can go in and hear that more. But I mean, the context is, that is, uh, I think, about a thousand times the current install battery capacity. I mean, the scale up needed is breathtaking, basically. Yeah. And, and, and um, yeah, so, so, so your vision is to commit Tesla to try to deliver on a meaningful percentage of what is needed yes. and, what, and call on others to do the rest. That this, yes. is what, this is a task for humanity to massively scale up our response to change, change yes. the energy grid. Yes, it, it, it's, it's, it's like basically how fast can we, can we scale um, and encourage others to scale uh, to get to that 300 terawatt hour in, installed uh, base of, of batteries. Right. Um, and then, of course, uh, there'll be a tremendous need to recycle those batteries, which is, uh, and, and it makes sense to recycle them because the raw materials are like high-grade ore. Um, so people shouldn't think, well, there'd be this big pile of batteries, nothing to get recycled because the, the, even a dead battery pack is worth about $1,000. So, um, but, but this is what's needed for a sustainable energy future. So we're, we're going to try to take a set of actions that accelerate the day of a, and, and bring the day of, of a sustainable energy future sooner. Okay. 
And this is where you need to be confident in your questions. I know this guy has a list of topics he needs to do, but even just watching this, I, I'm kicking myself right now because he talked about all those production mistakes. And I was thinking in my head, I'm like, what happens to all those parts? What happens to like all that paint, like anything that gets used? I, I guess it was recycled, but I'm just curious, like how, what happened? I mean, did they throw it away or did they recycle it? And he just answered the question, but now I'm kind of kicking myself for not interjecting because I had it, had it in my head, but just be confident in yourself with your question asking. There's going to be huge interest in your master plan when you, when you publish that. Um, meanwhile, I just, I would love to understand more what goes on in this brain of yours, because it is, it is a pretty unique one. I, I want to play, with your permission, this very funny opening from okay. SNL, Saturday Night Live. Can we have the volume there, actually, please? Sorry. It's an honor to be hosting Saturday Night Live. I mean that. Sometimes after I say something, I have to say, I mean that. <laughs> so people really know that I mean it. That's because I don't always have a lot of intonational variation in how I speak, <laughs> which I'm told makes for great comedy. I'm actually making history tonight as the first person with Asperger's to host SNL. And I think you followed that up with... At least the first person to admit it. The first person to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean... <laughs> but this, so this was a great yeah. thing to say. I, was, but to, to, I, I would love to understand whether, you know, how you think of, of Asperger's. Like, whether you can give us any sense of, even you as a boy, how, what, what the experience was, or as you now understand with the benefit of hindsight. Talk, can you talk about that a bit? Well, I think, uh, I think everyone's experience is going to be somewhat different. Um, uh, but I guess for me, the, the social cues were, were not uh, intuitive. So um, I was just very bookish, and I didn't understand uh, this. I, I guess others could sort of intuitively understand uh, what, what, what was meant by something. Um, I would just tend to take things very literally as just like the words as spoken were exactly what they meant. But, but then that didn't turn out to be wrong. <laughs> you can't, they do not, they're not simply saying exactly what they mean. They, there's all sorts of other things that are meant. It took me a while to figure that out. Um, so I was, you know, bullied quite a lot. Um, so I did, I did not have a, a sort of happy childhood, to be frank. It was quite, quite rough. Um, and, um, but I read a lot of books. I read lots and lots of books. And so that, you know, sort of gradually I sort of understood more from the books that I was reading and watched a lot of movies. Um, and, um, you know, just, but it took, it, took me, it took me a while to understand things that most people intuitively understand. So I've wondered whether it's possible that that was in a strange way an incredible gift to you and, and, and indirectly to many other people. In as much as brains, you know, are plastic and they, they, they go where the action is. And if, in, for some reason, the external world and social cues, which so many people spend so much time and energy and mental energy obsessing over, if that is partly cut off, isn't it possible that that, that is partly what gave you the ability to understand inwardly the world at a much deeper level than, than most people do? I suppose that's certainly possible. Um, I think there's maybe some value also from a technology standpoint, because um, I found it uh, rewarding to spend all night programming computers um, just by myself. And I think most people, most people don't enjoy typing strange symbols into a computer by themselves all night. Uh, they think that's not fun. But I thought it was, I really liked it. Um, so, so I would just program all night by myself. And um, I found that to be quite enjoyable. Um, but, but I think that is not uh, normal. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. it, it does, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about it's, it's a riddle to a lot of people of, of how you've done this, how you've repeatedly innovated in these different industries. And it, it does, you know, every entrepreneur sees possibility in the future and then acts to make that real. It, it feels to me like you see possibility just more broadly than almost anyone and can connect the dots. So you see scientific possibility based on a deep understanding of physics <clears throat> and, and knowing what the fundamental equations are, what the technologies are that are based on that science and where they could go. You see technological possibility. And then, really unusually, you combine that with economic possibility of like what it actually would cost. Is there a system you can imagine where you could affordably make that thing? And that, that sometimes you then get conviction that there is an opportunity here. Put those pieces together and you could do something amazing. Yeah, I, I think one aspect of whatever condition I had um, was I was just absolutely obsessed with truth, just obsessed with truth. Um, 
And, and so the obsession with truth is why I studied physics, uh, because physics attempts to understand the, the, truth, the truth of the universe. Physics just, is just what are the provable truths of the universe mm. um, and, and, tru and truths that have predictive power. Um, That's when I ask, so is time travel possible and are you going to be a part of it? So for me, physics was sort of a very natural thing to study. Um, no, nobody made me study it. It was intrinsically interesting to understand the nature of the universe. Um, and then computer science uh, or, in, in, or information theory, um, also to just understand uh, logic and, and uh, you know, there's an, also, there's an argument that, you know, that, you, the, that information theory is actually operating at a more fundamental level, more fundamental level than, than, than even physics. Um, so uh, just, yeah. Um, Physics and information theory uh, were really interesting to me. So, and how long did it take you to understand all that? I mean, I have ADHD and I'm a little dyslexic. And if you watch enough of my videos, even when I'm like doing these breakdowns, you'll see me kind of look up or any interviews I'll look up just because that's how my brain is processing. And I've noticed he's doing the same. So it's what I'm really curious to see what like how he understood physics. And I know he liked typing into the computer at long hours of the night, but it's like, did you just, is it one of those things where it's like Goodwill hunting where you just understand physics or just understand what's going on? Or it's like, how did you learn it? Like, did you love it that much just to keep like, you love the truth so much, but do you just keep going? Is that, is that like your North star or like, what was it? And how long did it take you to understand? When you say truth, you, I mean, it's, it's not like some people, so it's, what you're talking about is the truth of the universe, like the fundamental truths that drive the universe. It's, it's like a deep curiosity about what this universe is, why we're here, simulation, why not, you know, we don't have time to go into that. But I mean, it's, you're, you're just deep, deeply curious about what this is for, what this is, this whole thing. Yes. Uh, I mean, I think the why, the why of things is very important. Um, I, I actually, uh, when I was, a, I don't know, so t young teens, uh, I, I got quite depressed about the meaning of life, um, and I was trying to sort of understand the meaning of life, looking at reading religious texts and, and reading books on philosophy. And I, I got into the German philosophers, which is definitely not wise if you're a young teenager, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> be a bit, a bit dark. Um, so, uh, much better read as an adult. Uh, and, and then, actually, I ended up reading um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but, and, which is actually a, a book on philosophy just sort of disguised as a, as a silly humor book, but, but actually, the book, it's actually a philosophy book. And uh, Adams uh, makes the point that it, it's actually the, the, the question that is harder than the answer. Um, you know, he sort of makes a joke that the answer is 42. Um, that number does pop up a lot. Um, and, and 420 <laughs> is just 10, 40, 10, 10 times 42. 10 times more significant than so, 42, okay. Um, you know, there's, um, you can make a, a triangle with 42, or 42 degrees and 269s. You can already tell he's got theories going on up there. I would definitely be like, so what does that mean to you? Do you have any theories about that number or why it's there? Um, <laughs> it, so there's no such thing as a perfect triangle, or is there? Um, <laughs> but even more important than the answer is the question. So that, that was the whole theme of that book. I mean, is that, is that, is that yes, basically how you see it? You should have more of it. You can tell it looks like from this video that he's getting a little bit emotional about it. You could ask him why be like, I could tell you're super passionate about this. And maybe it's just me just a little emo. Like, why is this making you a little emotional? And it's not as if it's a, a done deal. Like it's all, to, it's all to play for. Like the future may be horrible. Still, there are scenarios where it is horrible, but you, you see a pathway to an exciting future, both on earth and on Mars and in our minds through artificial intelligence and so forth. I mean, in your, in your heart of hearts, do you really believe that you are helping deliver that exciting future for X and for others? I mean, I'm trying my hardest to do so. Um, I, you know, I love humanity, and I think that we should fight for a good future for humanity, and I think we should be optimistic about the future and fight to make that optimistic, optimistic future happen. And what are you going to do to combat the people who are going to come for you? Because there's, I feel like there are people in this world that want to see a burn. And you could tell he's all about that positivity. So I'd be curious to see how he is going to protect himself 
from anybody who tries to come at him and stop him from his dream. Oh man, I am so, I can't believe I forgot this question. So I was standing there for an hour and a half and I didn't realize it till I was sitting here editing. But if Elon Musk takes Twitter back, does that mean he's bringing Trump back? That's the last question. Why did he ask it? Because everybody's got to be thinking it. Everyone's got to be knowing it. Is he coming back? Is the Donald coming back? I don't know. We'll see. All right, that does it for this podcast interview breakdown. But before you go, if this is your first time on this channel, my goal is to help podcasters become the authority in their niche with video podcasting and podcast interviews. So if you have a podcast or you're thinking about starting one, this free download is for you. It's a list of my top 25 podcast interview questions that will make you sound like a pro so you can have engaging and entertaining conversations. The link is in the description, and we'll see you next time.